Hey Church family, I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us here online at Center Street Church. If this is your very first time, say hi in the chat. We'd love to get to know you. There should be a link to the website where you can share your story. We want to hear all about who you are and how you can be part of our family here at Center Street Church. Now, we're going to be jumping into worship really quickly here. So let's take a moment. Let's prepare our hearts. Put away our phones, any distractions. Take a second and just focus your heart and your mind on the Lord. And let's get ready to worship. Well, good evening, church. It's so wonderful that you're here. Would you stand up with us as we worship our, and praise our God this evening? Now let's put our hands together. That's right. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony. Let's declare this. If I'm not there, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not there, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come.
I'm not dead, then you're not done. Those words are so true. Grace rewrote my story, and I know it's rewriting your story as well. Friends, when we speak out the attributes of God and we praise Him daily, He can work mightily in our hearts and in our lives. Because you know what? Worship is a powerful form of warfare. Praying and singing out out loud about the greatness of God during moments when we're experiencing the life struggles, it makes a huge difference. Our hearts can begin to rise up and our feelings can change and we can see the sovereignty and the greatness of God. In Deuteronomy 24, it says this, for the Lord your God is the one who goes out with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. And in Psalms 150, it says this, praise him for his acts of power and praise him for his surpassing greatness. So church, we're not alone in our battles. And as we praise and we worship God, let us take heart tonight knowing he's already gone before us. He's already fought our battles. Our prayer life is so incredibly vital in our lives though in giving us protection do you believe that the enemy knows full well how we are pulling down his strongholds when we pray and when we worship he will try to intimidate us discourage us divide us defeat us and our relationship with god is the best antidote against the enemy's flaming missiles so i would like to pray a prayer with you tonight over the victory, for victory over the enemy schemes in our lives. So let's just bow our heads for a moment. Lord, thank you for your greatness. Thank you that when I am weak, you are strong. Lord, the devil is scheming, and I know he desires to keep me from spending time with you. So Father God, with your strength, I will not allow the enemy dominion over my time, over my thoughts, over my ways. Give me a measure of your strength, Lord Jesus, so that I might not give in to discouragement or to deception or doubt. Help me to trust in you and believe that what the enemy meant for evil, you will turn for my good. How great are you, Lord, that you would love me with all of my flaws and that you want to do great things in my life and through my life. In all my ways, Lord Jesus, may I rely on your greatness and your mighty power. You are the Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. My my, almighty fortress and my almighty God, I praise you, God. And I praise you that you will bring victory in my life today. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Continue to worship. The weapon may be for, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, declare it. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. See, there's power in the mighty name. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. In every war he wages, he will win. 
was saying we believe that there's power in the mighty name of Jesus and when we lift up our worship the enemy flees amen there's power in his name let's claim it and sing this together we'll sing a little louder 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 There's freedom in his house where the spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom. I just want to encourage you tonight in a room this size. I know that there is a lot of people walking in with fears of what tomorrow is going to look like, what next year is going to look like. Stress, anxiety, hurt, broken hearts, difficult relationships, financial problems, struggles, all those different things. And I was talking with my wife this morning as we were just catching up over breakfast and we just said, man, life is painful sometimes. Yes. If we're honest and, we're, and we really just are true with, honest with ourselves, it's tough. And it's, that's why it's so good to, be, to, to come into the house of the Lord, to be reminded that we're not alone in this pain. We're not alone in this struggle because the battle belongs to our Lord. And even though the enemy takes things and tries to turn them around, our God turns them for good. He turns our trash into something beautiful. And so I want you to just take a moment and just offer whatever it is that you're wrestling with the, tonight up to the Lord. It, just ask him, God, what do I just need to release to you? What am I white knuckling? What, what do I need to give to you and declare your victory over? So come on, just take a couple moments. Lord, I thank you that you're powerful, that you conquer the grave. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that your name is higher above any name. That there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. We thank him for what he did on the cross so that we can come in freedom. That when we call on his name, he is here and he hears us. He listens. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for your mercy that's new every morning. Thank you for your grace that's sufficient in our weakness. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that 
It does our souls well to ponder his amazing grace, doesn't it? I was reading this morning in a book by C.S. Lewis that we know our posture before God is right when we think of, ponder, pray to our holy God and realize that we have even, we have forgotten ourselves entirely, or we recognize that we are small and dirty objects. I'll let you determine. 
which is the best descriptor for you. It is great to see you here this evening. It is good to be in the house of our Lord and to worship him together, amen? Please have a seat. If you are new here to Center Street Church, we hope you're already feeling at home and very welcome here. We'd love to meet you, connect with you, get to know you a little bit better. And so please stop by our new here area, say hello to Pastor Greg uh, in the atrium after the service. And you can also visit Pastor Wes and Amy at the Connect Center. You can see what's going on, what's coming up, and how you can maybe get better involved in the life of Center Street Church. We do want to let you know about an opportunity you have to invite people to know Jesus and become his devoted followers. Come and See Weekend is happening in two weeks, and this is a chance for people in your life to learn more about what we believe and to equip you to have some great conversations. If there's someone in your life who's interested in faith in Jesus or someone that you're just having really great conversations with about Christianity, this is a great opportunity to bring them here and to learn together. At Center Street Church, we are a people of prayer. And our day of prayer is coming this Wednesday. We invite you to set aside some special time for prayer during the day. And then in the evening, come here to Central Campus at 7 p.m. to join in a time of corporate prayer. Healing prayer will also be available, and you can learn more about the day and what goes on on our website. Now, as we're thinking of prayer, we want to pray for an exciting event that's being hosted right here at Central Campus of Center Street Church. The One Conference offers us a chance to extend a generous welcome to church leaders from across Canada as they come together and learn about how they can have a greater impact for the kingdom of God wherever it is that God has placed them. We get to do this because we have a building that can host a conference of this size, and it gives us a chance to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. On the screen behind me is a list of all the churches and organizations participating in the conference. Please look over the list and see if there are two or three names there that God is inviting you to uphold in prayer. In a moment, we're going to take some time to pray silently together for those that God has highlighted to you. Would you pray, please, that for the folks representing these churches and organizations, that the conference would be a time of refreshing, a time of empowerment, a time of equipping, and a renewed passion for the work of the gospel. Just take a couple of moments right now to pray, if you would. The Bible tells us that your tithes and offerings are holy to God, something we do not take lightly here. Your generosity allows us to be generous with the churches and organizations you just saw, as well as being a blessing to those beyond the walls and boundaries of Center Street Church. If the Lord is calling you to do so, there are offering boxes on the walls 
by the entrance doors, as well as a number of ways that you can give on the screen behind me. Would you please join me in prayer? Our great and awesome Father God, we are grateful for your presence here. And Lord, you are so very welcome here. Father, we thank you for our many blessings, both big and small, and pray that you would use and multiply these gifts that are holy unto you. Father, we pray for our world and all that is going on in it. We pray for our leaders and for those you are calling to lead and to grow. We are thankful for this church building and the opportunity to host the upcoming conference. May all who enter here feel the warmth of your presence. Father, we pray for our families. We celebrate with those who are experiencing the wonder of new life. And Lord, we grieve with those who have experienced recent loss, like the Hong family and the Amory family. Minister to all of them, Lord, we pray. And Father, as Pastor Henry comes now to share with your word, I pray that you would open the eyes and ears of our heart to receive what it is you have to say to us. Teach us, Lord, we pray. We give it all to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we welcome all of you who are joining us online and those of you who are gathered here at Central Campus, along with others who are joining us uh, from one of our other campuses in Airdrie and Bridgeland, and out in Bearspaw and down in South Calgary. Now, before we get into the message, I just need you to know that um, recently someone opened up a fake social media account in my name, picture and all. Uh, quite possibly for sinister reasons. Now, this has happened a few times before, and so I just want to remind you, uh, our church, that I do not have a personal social media presence. Um, if you receive anything from me through social media, it isn't me. It is someone who is pretending to be me. So please ignore it, report it, and I will thank you for it. Now, if you're new to our church, uh, we're making our way through the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which has a lot to say about the present and the future. Now, significant portions of Revelation use a lot of figurative language, symbols, and images, which are not always easy to interpret and understand. But as you're going to see, it has much to say to us about how we're to live in the present and also how we're to prepare for the future. So hang in there with us as we make our way through this fascinating book. You know, people who have been hurt by others often ask me about the character of God and the ways of God. They wonder, if God is holy and just, then why doesn't he put a stop to all the evil in the world? Why doesn't God destroy the wicked and those who defy him and make the world that he intended it to be in the beginning? In Revelation chapter 6, we hear a similar cry from the souls of Christian martyrs. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? For centuries, people have been crying out to God to intervene, to put a stop and to judge all those who are evil and who are doing evil. Well, in chapters 
10 and 11, we we receive assurance from the Lord that a day is coming when the mystery of God's silence on this issue will be broken and that the opening of the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6 and the trumpet judgments in chapters 8 and 9 and the bowl judgments we have yet to examine are in part God's response to these questions. Not only is a final and a great tribulation coming in which God's wrath and justice will be poured out and all the, on all those who have defiantly rejected him or ignored him. But after this time of tribulation, Christ will return and his kingdom will be established on earth. Satan will be bound and righteousness will rule and Christ will be king. And all the mockers who said, you know, where is God? Prove God to me. Where is this second coming of Christ that you keep talking about? All of that will be silenced. And the thousands of years of sin and death, lies, murders, thefts, Immorality and the death of martyrs will be over as well. And so with that in mind, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. And as I pointed out last time, in these two chapters, there is an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet judgments of God. An interlude is like the intermission in a hockey game. A pause from the action where players sort of catch their breath, calm down, the coach encourages and challenges them and reminds them about things that they need to keep uppermost in their thinking. Well, in a similar way, in this interlude, God reminds his people both in the present but also in the future that even though all hell is breaking loose in their world, he has not forgotten about them, but he is still very much on the throne, very much in control, and that they will ultimately be victorious through faith in Jesus Christ and in their ongoing trust of Christ. So if you're able, I'm going to invite you to stand now and join me in reading the first portion of chapter 11 together. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time that they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud 
while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and their survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for teaching us about who you are through our study here of Revelation. Help us, Lord, to understand what it is that you're saying here, Lord. And also, Lord, what you're saying to us and what you're calling us to do about it. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we read this passage together, you probably realize that it's a rather difficult passage to understand, which is why I want to take a moment to talk about a key principle in interpreting Scripture. Someone has said that the golden rule of biblical interpretation is this. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. But take every word at its primary literal meaning unless the context obviously indicates that figurative language is being used. Now this principle of interpretation is easy to apply to most of the Bible. For example, we just finished a study in the book of Romans. And in Romans 12 verse 9, it says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now that's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's clear that it's meant to be taken literally. We don't have to go through a lot of interpretation there. We just have to focus on application, don't we? So that's clear. But now consider this. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said this about himself. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now, obviously, we understand that Jesus doesn't mean that he's a literal gate with hinges. Jesus used the symbol of a gate to communicate that faith and trust in his teaching, his life, death, and resurrection are the way through which we are reconciled to God and we become a friend of God. It's really no different than us reading, say, a sports magazine about a pivotal, pivotal play made by a baseball player that reads like this. The, the batter shot around first base, blew around second, and screamed into third. We know the writer is using figurative language here, but we all understand that the batter is still a real person and that he actually made it to third base. His runners may be on fire, but he made it to third base. Well, in most of the Bible, it's easy to spot this distinction between what's to be taken literally and what's to be meant to be taken figuratively. Well, things get a little bit more interesting and a little bit more complex in the book of Revelation, especially in the section of Scripture we're in right now, Revelation 6 to 18, and we're in the middle of that now. Because almost all of these chapters use apocalyptic visions and symbols and images that some believe that these chapters were actually meant to be read and interpreted figuratively, more like an allegory. For example, they believe that the beast that we read about a moment ago is not a literal person, but is clearly figurative of a devil-inspired movement that is in opposition to Christ and his kingdom. Now, futurists agree that when the Antichrist is referred or the, uh, as the beast here, the term beast is a figurative term, perhaps depicting his evil 
destructive nature. But they ask this question, why conclude that the beast or the antichrist, as he's often referred to, isn't a real person? I mean, if we see that Jesus is a real person, even though he refers to himself figuratively as a gate, then why can't the Antichrist be seen as a real person, even though he's referred to figuratively as the beast? And so futurists believe that in the same way that the seven churches that we read about in Revelation 2 and 3, that they are real churches, they believe the great tribulation described in chapters 6 to 18 in Revelation is a very real event. As are the two witnesses and the beast and the events that we find here in chapter 11. Now having said that, as I have examined how these two dominant views um, interpret Revelation, there are differences, of course. But I'm amazed at how often the general principles that we need to apply to our lives are essentially the same. And we're going to see that as we examine this chapter more closely. And so with that in mind, let's look at verse 1. John writes this, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now the question is, what temple is John to measure? I mean, we know that the first temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 586 BC. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And so when John was asked to measure the temple, no actual physical temple remained in Jerusalem. Right now, on Temple Mount, all that we have there in the place where the temple once was is the dome uh, on the rock, uh, which is an Islamic shrine. So people wonder, well, was this command here in verse 1 to measure the temple, is it making reference to a new temple, a third literal temple yet to be built? Well, some believe that it is. Based on the prophecy we find in Jeremiah 33, verse 14 and on, they believe that a third temple will be built. And since, just for your information, since 1987 there has been a very organized movement to make preparations for the rebuilding of the third temple. And apparently, everything that they need to do so is already in place. And so this passage may be referring to a literal temple being built in Jerusalem during the seven-year tribulation period. On the other hand, we know that the Apostle Paul at times referred to all those who believe in Jesus Christ as God's temple. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul wrote, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? So however one interprets this, there is one truth that we need to take hold of. And that is this. God will protect those who love him. You see, God's command to John to measure the temple of God and the altar, and I want you to notice, to actually count the worshipers that are at the altar, is actually a sign of God's care and concern for his people. See, this wasn't about measuring the physical dimensions of the temple of God, since no measurements were given. This was about measuring the number of God's people. In other words, identifying God's people. Whether it's Jewish people, whether it's Jews and Gentiles who have come to faith in Christ, 
God is saying, I'm going to keep track of my people and I'm going to protect them. No one, nothing can take you away from me. Yes, for 42 months of the tribulation, you may have to endure hardship and suffering and even face death itself. But nothing can ever separate you from my love and my promise of eternal life. God says to the tribulation saints, I got you, you are mine. Now I want you to notice in verse 2, John is told not to measure the outer courtyard, which is the court of the Gentiles. And if measuring the inner court is God saying, I'm going to protect my spiritual children, then not measuring the outer courtyard means the opposite. That those who defiantly refuse to embrace Jesus by faith, they will be outside of God's protection, which is incredibly tragic. And also, therefore, why in verse 3, God empowers two witnesses who will preach the gospel for 1,280 days or three and a half years, dressed in sackcloth, which is worn to symbolize an attitude of humility and also to symbolize a spirit of sorrow and repentance over a city. The city of Jerusalem is compared to Sodom a little later and also to Egypt during the time of slavery. It's, it's, it's compared to those two, um, uh, those two um, nations and, and cities. And, and, and it's, it's a terrible um, image of, of what's going on in Jerusalem. And so these, these two witnesses um, are, are just um, uh, so heavy burdened for the state of the people who are in Jerusalem at that time that they literally wear sackcloth. I just get itchy thinking about it um, and to, to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, we aren't sure who these witnesses are, but verse 4 gives us a clue. It says, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. And you're thinking, ah, well, that makes sense. You know, uh, that's who they are. Right, got it. Well, look at verse 5 and 6. We read there that these two witnesses have incredible power to preach and to impact millions. And that power is given to them by God. And that's where that illustration in verse uh, 4 uh, comes into play. In Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah sees a golden lampstand and these two lampstands are fueled by oil from two olive trees on either side. That's the image that's referred to in verse 4. And in verse 6, God uses this image to remind Zechariah that it's not by might, nor by power. In other words, it's not by human might, it's not by human power, but by my spirit says the Lord God Almighty. That's where the incredible power that these two witnesses have, um, that's where it comes from. In fact, that is where the power source of every Christian today to introduce other people to Jesus comes from. It's his power. It's his work in us and through us in response to our prayers and to our trust in him. Now verse 5 says, if anyone tries to harm these two witnesses, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Now that's a fairly shocking capability if you think about it. You've heard about bad breath. Well, this is deadly breath. 
Verse 6 tells us that these two witnesses have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time that they're prophesying and that they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, these things that they're able to do and what they do, fire, drought, water turned to blood, the striking of the earth with plagues, are all very similar judgments inflicted in the Old Testament by Moses and Elijah, which is why some people believe that it is Elijah and Moses who are the two witnesses described here. Now, others believe that these two witnesses could be symbolic of a whole group of people who are witnessing. But there's really no reason uh, not to take this reference, uh, this reference to two witnesses literally. And besides, I don't think the identity of the witnesses, or for that matter, the number of witnesses, is all that important. What is important is their ministry. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ is being preached. And as a result, there are literally millions of Jews and many Gentiles in the world at that time who will come to faith in Christ. Which brings me to a second truth that we need to embrace. God's grace extends to everyone. You know, our God loves us so much that he's doing all that he can to pull us toward himself and to a friendship with him for all eternity. Some of you may have all kinds of regrets about the way that you've lived your life. You may think that you've crossed the line of no return, that God will never receive you, uh, he'll never forgive you for what you've done. Well, if you're thinking that, then reflect deeply on what God is doing here in this passage of Scripture. Even though there's a day coming when God's grace will be no more here on the earth. And even though one day Jesus is going to come back and he is going to make everything that's wrong in our world right, until that day and right up to the last possible second, he refuses to give up on us. He keeps seeking us out. He keeps trying to get our attention, calling out to us through his witnesses to come home to him. In fact, if you don't know where you stand with the Lord today, he's calling out to you right now. And I challenge you, and I, in fact, I plead with you to reach out to him in faith and trust and give him your life and that you would do it even before you leave today. Those of you who are parents here, perhaps you have had a moment or perhaps you have had a time, maybe you're experiencing it right now, where your child is away and you don't know where they are. And you have been searching for them. You've been longing for them to come home. But they're not coming home. You know what that's doing to your adrenaline, to your ability to sleep. You would do anything for them to return. That is exactly how our Heavenly Father feels about you if you've been ignoring him or rejecting him. He longs for you to come home. Now look at verse 7. It says this, Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kills them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. That's referring to Jerusalem. Now the beast most likely represents, as I mentioned earlier, the Antichrist. The beast is incredibly powerful, and he attacks and kills the two witnesses. And their bodies are left on the public square in Jerusalem for all to see and to gloat over, which is one of the deepest insults that can occur in that culture. 
This is like the bodies of the American soldiers that were hung on a bridge in Baghdad a number of years ago during the conflict there with ISIS. Now, as terrible as all of that is, there's another truth we need to take note of at this point. Yes, the beast is powerful, and he can do a lot of damage, but he is still under the rule of God, which means he can do nothing outside of God's permission. I want you to notice again in verse 7 that the beast can't touch the two witnesses until when? Until they have finished their testimony. Until they have finished the work God has called them to do. Which leads to another truth that we need to embrace and we need to hold on to. God will make a way for us to complete the assignment that he gives us. Friends, if you're a follower of Christ and you're surrendered totally to him and you're faithfully living and doing what he has called you to do, then God will make sure that nothing gets in the way of you completing his purposes for your life. Whether it's cancer, whether it's ill health, whether it's job loss, or a cruel criticism and accusation from others. All of that may discourage you. It may set you back for a time, but God will make a way through it all for you to accomplish the good purpose in you and through you and the assignment that he has given to you. If God calls you to share your faith, for example... People may threaten you. They may hurt you emotionally, even physically. They may laugh at you. They may try to shame you. But God will make a way for you to share what he's called you to share. You know, in my late teens, God called me to full-time ministry. And as many of you have heard me share, I spent over a, over a year just refusing to even think about that sense of call from God, I just kept just ignoring it and pushing it away. Because I thought I had a better plan for my life. When I finally said yes, it was only a few years after that that my doctor informed me that I had cancer. And I'd be lying to you if, you know, if I didn't tell you that there were times that I found myself asking the Lord, Lord, I don't understand why you would call me to serve you in full-time ministry and then allow this to come into my life. And I can still remember where I was when I distinctly heard the Lord whisper to me, Henry, you're not coming home until I say you're coming home. And I'm not calling you home until you complete the assignment that I've given you. Just keep your eyes on me. You just follow my lead and trust me with the rest. Church, have you ever wondered why we're still here as Christians and not in heaven? I mean, if the only reason that we're still here on earth as Christians is to study and learn the Bible more. You know, listen to a sermon in church like you are right now, and then even more sermons, you know, um, by, by preachers online. You ever think about it? I mean, he'd just call us home. If that was the main reason we're here, he'd just take us home to heaven where we'll know the Bible perfectly and we'll understand a whole lot of other things perfectly. If the only reason that we're still here on earth is to worship him, uh, to draw closer to him, and to draw closer to one another, and all those things are wonderful things. But if that's the primary reason we're here, well, he'd call us home right away. Because in heaven, we're going to worship him, we're going to know him, and we're going to draw closer to him, and we're going to draw closer to one another in a greater and more meaningful way than we ever could here on this planet. You see, 
The scriptures teach that the primary reason that we're still here is to join him in seeking and saving the lost. I mean, that's why he sent his only son, Jesus, to become the God-man, to live among us, to teach us, to ultimately die for us and rise from the grave, to make a way for us to become a friend of God. This really matters to God. And it's quite possible that you're still here and you're not in heaven because there is someone he wants you to introduce him to. Just like he called and he empowered these two witnesses to boldly tell all who would listen about the Jesus they worshipped and loved. Now verse 11 says that after three and a half days, while the whole world is watching, something by the way that wouldn't have been possible until our day through satellite technology, while the whole world is watching apparently, the two witnesses are miraculously rescued by God and are called home to be with God. And I can just kind of imagine, let my imagination go, you know, kind of free here. And I can just see them lying there dead, and then suddenly their fingers start twitching, and then their feet. And then one by one they get up, and they look at the crowds who are stunned, and they say, we're back! And then God calls them home. And you see, here's the point. In the moment of their greatest defeat and shame, God uses their death and resurrection, along with an earthquake, to not only stun the people of Jerusalem and everywhere else, but to draw many people to himself. Which reveals yet another truth that we need to embrace and hold on to. God can use our greatest defeats to accomplish his greatest victories. You know, there are times in life where it just seems like all that is good and all that is right is finished and done for. That the good guys are finished and the bad guys, they're out there gloating and rejoicing. What's right is seen as wrong. What's wrong is seen as right. It seems like evil's one. And good is destroyed. I'm sure as we look at some of the insanity that's going on in the world around us right now, many of us feel this way. And I'm sure there have been times in our lives, perhaps even right now, where we're feeling deeply discouraged, even defeated about something going on in our own lives. Something that's going on in our marriages or in our families or our friendships or our work situation. I mean, you poured decades of your life into something. You made all kinds of sacrifices. You went the extra mile at work or perhaps an area that you were serving in faithfully. And then one day you're just let go or you're unfairly criticized and judged by people. People you thought you knew. People you thought who cared for you. People you thought who understood you. And what you do and why you do it. And it just takes the air right out of your life. The light in your eyes grow dim. You feel like the two witnesses lying dead on the street. Like Satan is one, hope is gone. Have you ever felt that? Recently, I read a little piece about the church in China. Back in 1949, the Chinese church numbered about a half a million people, largely as a result of the faithful witness of missionaries from the West. But following the communist takeover of 1949, all the missionaries were forced to flee. It was a time of great discouragement and defeat the communist government imprisoned, tortured, 
and killed many pastors and Christians in the years that followed, um, which is now referred to as the Cultural Revolution. In 1958, the government had closed all visible churches. Chairman Mao's wife told foreign visitors that Christianity in China has been confined to the history section of the museum. She said it's dead and buried. In the 1970s, a visiting Christian delegation reported there is not a single Christian left in China. So what do you do when it seems like all the great people of faith are gone? When all that's good is dead and buried? Well, maybe a better question is, what does God do? Well, he has a resurrection, folks. When God's people seem to be down for the count, lying dead in the street, and the work of the Lord seems to be finished, God in his way and in his time will bring about a resurrection that will ultimately not only change the discouraging situation that we find ourselves in, but will also eventually change the world. Ray Steadman once said that resurrection power works best in the graveyards. And you know, there's truth to that. It works best when it seems like life is gone, hope is gone, and, and we've just, we're just totally broken. You may be facing a major personal failure, a sickness, or some other circumstances that has just knocked you to the floor. Well, God's word here teaches us that God uses these failures and these disappointments to teach us that resurrection power works best in graveyards. The apostle Peter learned this. He denied Jesus three times, even though, you know, he just, he swore that he would never deny Christ. And when he realized his failure, he not only wept bitter tears, but he basically just walked away from his future and what Jesus had called him to. He went back to fishing. And it was at his lowest moment when Jesus approached him and then called him to feed his sheep. And Peter, in the midst of his greatest defeat, experienced a resurrection of sorts, a resurrection of vision, of hope, of calling in his life. And God, and Jesus used Peter uh, to build his church in profound ways. And what about the church in China? Did the church die out? Well, most of you know it hasn't. I'm told the church in China, though mostly underground, numbers over 100 million people and is sending out missionaries to other parts of the world. Through their greatest moment of defeat, God has accomplished his greatest victories. And the same can be true for you and for me. God can use our greatest defeats and failures to accomplish his, the greatest victories he wants to accomplish in our lives. Now, I don't have time to get into the sounding of the seventh trumpet, starting in verse 15, but I do want to leave us with one more truth. God in Christ has made a way for us to have access to him and to heaven. Look at verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. That sounds like weather in Calgary. After seeing the majesty of God and the judgments of God, John is allowed to see the Holy of Holies, that most sacred place in the temple where God truly dwelt. You'll recall that no one was allowed into the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. And even when he went in, they would tie a rope around one of his legs in case he, um, just his, his um, 
seeing um, the presence of God might mean the end of his life and they would pull him out so that they wouldn't have to go in. And you see, a veil separated the Holy of Holies from the temple because of our sin. But then Jesus died and the veil was torn in two. Why? Because Jesus took our place of punishment. He who had no sin became sin for us. And he took upon himself our sins and he paid for them. And when we place our faith in him, our sins, a great exchange takes place. Our sins are transferred to his account and his holy righteousness is transferred to our account making us holy and righteous in God's sight, not because we are perfect in this life, in the temporary realm, but because uh, in the eternal realm, by faith in Jesus Christ, we are now in him and he is in us. And he is perfect and righteous. and, And God's wrath and justice is satisfied. And because of what Christ accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection, we now have free access to God. We can enter his presence. We can enter the Holy of Holies anytime we want through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And a time is coming when we will get to heaven and then we will see the Lord face to face. What a day that's going to be. And so it's with all that in mind that we're now going to transition and take the Lord's Supper together. Let's just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you today for your faithfulness, for your mercy and grace and for saving us from our sins. And loving us, Lord, despite our failures and sin. Lord, we long to be in a close relationship with you. And so, Lord, we confess to you today those times that we've gone our way rather than your way. Those times we've not involved you in our, way, our day. Those times we've just taken you for granted. Even though you gave your life to make a way for us to have free access to you. Lord, cleanse us from sin. Renew us by your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name. I pray, Lord, that you would bless and sanctify with your word and spirit these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine that we receiving them, Lord, may be partakers of the divine nature through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, friends, if you have truly and sincerely repented of your sins and you're in right relationship with the Lord and also with others, I just encourage to join us in this, the taking of this holy sacrament. So if you would just take the, this little container here and turn it upside down and help yourself to the little wafer. And Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And as you do, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. 
Let's take it together with thanksgiving. And then Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as you do, receive his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his healing with thanksgiving. Let's take of it together. Would you please stand? Let's join together in just giving praise and thanks for the greatness of our God.
ask the prayer partners if you would just make your way up here. And I just want to again just put out a call to anyone here, if you don't know personally the Jesus that we're talking about, if you're not sure, you'd be one of those who would be ready to meet him when he comes. And we know he's coming. Take the time to make your life right with the Lord. These prayer partners would love to pray with you, pray for you, um, talk to you about questions you might have. And if you have any other prayer requests, they'd love to pray with you about that as well. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God be with you. Church, we're so glad that you were able to join with us in worship today. We hope that it was a blessing to you, that you were able to hear from the Holy Spirit, and that he's changing your heart and your life in amazing ways. Now, we know that there's nothing like worshiping together in person with the body of Christ. We want to invite you to join us at any one of our five campuses in Airdrie, Bearspaw, Bridgeland, Central, or South Calgary. We have all these campuses that we want you to be involved in, so come join us, be part of our family in these spaces. Now, as we go into our week, we just want to bless you. Um, we hope that the Lord will continue to speak to you throughout this week, and we hope to see you again next week.